Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Rural Health Clinic Workshop presented by the Oregon Office of Rural Health. My name is Rondi Ann Gerst, and I am the Rural Health Clinic Program Manager and will be the moderator of this session today. First, I'd like to thank our partners, All Care Health, Oregon Rural Health Association, Silver Partners, Eastern Oregon Coordinated Care Organization, Oregon Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, and Riverhouse on the Deschutes. Bronze Partner, RQI, and our Copper Partners, Westcom, American College of Education, and Inquisite. Their continued support during these difficult times has made it possible for the Office of Rural Health to bring the conference and workshop to you at no cost. You should have received an email with the link to our conference app. Use this app to visit our partners' virtual booths and enter to win prizes, network with others, and share photos of your clinic, providers, and community. We would love to see them. Session evaluation. After this session, you will receive a survey. Please help us continue to make improvements by completing the survey. In addition, this is how you will receive your CE credits and you will be entered in a drawing to win a $100 gift card. To present Growing Your RHC, please welcome Katie Jo Rabel, CPA and partner at Whitfley. Hi everyone, happy to be here and thanks for tuning in. i um, excited to talk with you about growing your RHC. Today, I'd like to go over a couple things um, to consider Every, of course, everything isn't all inclusive, but these are some things that we think you should consider when either growing your RHC, let's talk service wide or expanding your area um, of patients that you're serving. Those are some items that we're gonna be talking today. So if we could go to the next slide. So our learning objectives will identify sources of data that can be used in evaluating the need for maybe new services in the community, and that may be a way that you wanna grow your rural health clinic. We'll evaluate the benefits of potential new services that can be offered in the RHC and, and things to consider that way. And what financial and operational challenges of introducing new services or methods of care delivery or care delivery addresses that you may be adding to your rural health clinic, how is that gonna affect um, your financial position and um, Rural health clinic rates. Moving on. So our, our agenda for today, we'll talk about data collection, facility planning. We'll also explore service expansion as a method of um, growing your rural health clinic. Again, we'll talk about considerations and then how do we implement and move forward once we have a plan in place as far as how we want to grow our rural health clinic. So first of all, some initial questions. When you're talking about growing your rural health clinic, this can encompass a, a myriad of ideas. What are we talking about exactly when we're referring to growth? Is it that we want to physically grow our clinic and maybe want, we want to expand our existing facility building? Um, maybe we wanna add on to our existing building, our existing RHC address, and we provide the same services within that building or maybe we want to um, add additional services. So this addition to an existing facility, which keep in mind, each rural health clinic is certified by address. If we add to our existing facility and it's considered one address, we keep our rural health clinic status intact. So this may be to, to support additional volumes, again, to additional services. Um, maybe we have an expansion of hours that we're talking about when we're referring to growth. Maybe we want to, incorporate walk-in or urgent care clinic into our rural health clinic. One important thing is urgent cares and walk-ins do qualify as RHC services and are not considered specialties. So even on their own, let's say we, again, we add on to our existing rural health clinic and we incorporate walk-in or urgent care into that clinic uh, location. That's all part of one rural health clinic. We don't have to have a separate RHC certification for that. It doesn't 
it isn't considered specialty. So we still, you know, we don't have to incorporate those numbers in order to meet our 51% predominant primary care um, requirement for the conditions of participation. It is considered primary care. So walk-in urgent care is really how we're marketing to our patient population. And we'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, so expansion of hours, that might be another way you want to grow your rural health clinic. Or maybe you really want to increase your market footprint. You're in one zip code and you want to expand services to another area. Maybe you want to um, move into an entire different county. Maybe you want to move into a different state, for example. And I will mention, we have rural health clinics that are provider-based to hospitals that have rural health clinics in different states. And as long as you're in an adjacent state, it's okay. And if you meet their conditions of participation and licensing requirements, if there are any, then you can go ahead and do that. We can talk about that as well. So again, the first thing that we really want to focus in on when we're talking growth, because we can all kind of, you know, we, we can get into a meeting and talk about what we want to grow our rural health clinic. Well, what does growing our clinic really mean? Um, so we need to get there first. And it might be a combination of these things, but that's the first thing is we need, we want to get to what are we talking about when we're talking about growth? Moving on, of course, should we even grow? If we define what growth means to us, and let's say, you know, we want to increase our volumes, well, do we have the staff to even provide additional um, visits within our clinic? How is our recruitment and retention of our providers? How's our nursing staff? Do we have a facility that has enough room to increase our volumes? or our patient's gonna be simply just waiting in the waiting room longer. Um, is there a need? <clears throat> Do we have patients that are waiting to see our doctors or you know, are we kind of where we need to be? Do we even need to grow in our community or are we at a good position where we're at right now? And if we grow our rural health clinic, are we RHC compliant if we do? So I mentioned before the conditions of participation for rural health clinics. We need to keep in mind that our RHC um, services that we're performing are 51% primary care of our total. Now, there's some other ways kind of around that. We can look at the state operations manual, and the state operations manual refers to number of hours. So we can, we can defend this a couple of different ways. But if we incorporate, um, you know, specialty services into our rural health clinic, do we meet that primary care predominance? One, that's one thing to think about. If we grow our rural health clinic and we say, well, we need a different building in order to provide the services that we're talking about, we can't just simply provide these services in our current existing facility. If we move our rural health clinic, are we located in a current HIPSA that's been last updated within the last four years? Are we considered in a rural area still? Um, if not, we put our RHC certification in jeopardy. So those are that we want to make sure that we dot all our I's, cross all of our T's. When we decide to do something anytime within our rural health clinic, again, adding services, moving, um, addition to a building, we want to make sure that we're not going to put our RHC uh, certification in jeopardy. So let's talk about things that we we may use or need in order to make the decisions regarding growing our rural health clinic. So first off, data is so important. And what kind of data would we be collecting when we're looking at growing our rural health clinic? So when we want to form an initial strategy, we're going to plan what we're going to do. And let's say if we're planning a specific service line, um, or if we're going to move into a new area, some some data that we might want to gather is in relation to market share, population demographics, physician or provider supply, and then who's our competition? What are we looking at? So let's dive into this a little bit further. <clears throat> so one, we want to define our market. If we're talking about growing a rural health clinic in our existing market, and let's say maybe we want to provide additional hours or services for our staff or our patients in our existing market, 
what is that existing market and how are we servicing those patients now? How might we be able to grow? And is there a need for those services in our area that's not currently being met? So when we, we definitely want to define our market and what we're talking about as far as growing, or maybe we're going into a new market altogether. So when we want to define our market, And we want to figure out what our market position is either in that current market or if it's in a different market altogether, what market position does our competition have in that area? And is there room for growth within um, that defined market? So this slide really tells us one, the population of this particular market and um, demographics related to that population area, how many encounters are being serviced for this market and then in this particular case, our clinic visits in this existing rural health clinic that we're seeing out of total um, primary care visits and specialty visits um, that are being serviced. So in this case, we have about 40% market share. So of that remaining amount that's being seen, is that because we're turning away those patients? Um, is it for services that we're not providing and maybe we could provide for? You know, those are the types of things that we wanna look at. We also want to look at the demographics of that population. So um, this is going to help us determine then based on the demographics of that defined market area, um, the age of those patients, um, what type of payer mix it is. This will then help us assess what type of providers that we need and likely the services. Obviously, in, if we're in that 20 to 30 um, plus range, we're going to be looking at, okay, if we have high population, we're going to need OB and women's health. We're going to likely need a lot of pediatric care. Um, and again, our patient population. If our Medicare and Medicaid population for that area is relatively low, rural health clinic status may not be a winner in the end. Maybe we don't need to look at rural health clinic status, and maybe we want to add on another clinic in that area but we may not want to make it a rural health clinic because if we're Medicare, um, you know, and we're a freestanding rural health clinic, we're capped at a certain rate. So that may not make sense. Um, and if our, if we're highly um, in that younger population that doesn't have Medicare, then RHC status doesn't matter because rural health clinic status only affects our Medicare and Medicaid payers. Um, if we're in that higher age demographic, then we want to th be thinking about, okay, internal med, um, orthopedics, podiatry, you know, what specialty services might we want to have in that rural health clinic besides primary care? Uh, we might be want to be thinking about that. So your, your payer mix is extremely important when you're analyzing an area. Um, and again, the age range of that population is extremely important as well when you're making decisions again on how to grow your rural health clinic. When we talk also about growing a rural health clinic, we wanna talk about a provider supply. And this really slide just illustrates that um, we wanna be looking into the future where we are, may, are now um, and where we may be in the future regarding physician supply and demand. Um, do we have a shortage in that particular defined market area? and how can we recruit for that area? Um, in this particular case, uh, this could support some general surgery and ortho surgery providers. You know, this is information that you can gather from your consultant that might help you um, make a decision on, again, what sort of service line you may wanna add to your rural health clinic. And um, if you have the, the supply of providers in order to provide those services. Data collection, again, can also, um, it's gonna be internal. Um, we are gonna need financial information, so cost information, preliminary financial projections. Always analyzing is very important. So we're never gonna go make a big decision uh, like this without analyzing. How is an addition of a service, how will that possibly affect our Medicare rates, our Medicaid rates, if we're adding on a, a specialty service onto a provider-based rural health clinic that's provider-based to a critical access hospital, that could have a major effect on our critical access hospitals, hospital reimbursement. 
Um, so we don't want to leave that out of it. You know, we can talk about, yeah, we want a really high rural health clinic rate, but that doesn't always make sense um, in a provider-based RHC world. And if we're a freestanding rural health clinic, we're capped at a certain rate for Medicare and adding on specialty services isn't going to get us any more for Medicare. We may be already tapped out on our rate and it may not be something that we want to add on to a freestanding rural health clinic. So understanding what type of RHC you are, what type of hospital your provider based to because critical access hospital versus a prospectively paid hospital makes a big difference in when you're adding on costs and whether or not you want to make your RHC cost per visit as high as possible. If you're a PPS hospital and you add on a rural health clinic, um, as much costs as we can shove in our RHC, usually the better off we are because that may be the only cost-based reimbursed department that you have in that hospital. So projections, analyzing, all of that is super important. And that's going to come again from your existing Medicare cost report. Again, if you're um, if you're it's a whole new service line, budgeting and financial projections are in enormously important and part of that is calculating your or estimating your Medicare and Medicaid rates. We also want to get um, internal data from our customers. You know, what's their satisfaction rates? What's your satisfaction rates in the clinics? If you added on services, uh, would they come to your clinic? Quality data is important. Your cur current utilization is very important. So gather all of that together, use what you have and maybe implement some some data collection um, methods prior to making any decisions. Let's talk facility planning. So facility planning, we may, um, again, wanna be adding space to our current clinic. One, as a, as a facility, um, as an organization, do you have a master facility plan for your organization? Do you, is this part of your strategic plan? If it's not, maybe this is something to add on to your uh, annual program evaluation. You know, this isn't a required part of your annual program evaluation, but this may be something that you want to consider as an internal look at your clinic and what's your strategic plan for the future. This will size up your current space needs and it looks at the future for you know, your future space planning needs. Um, and this is a really important process to go through before you engage architects. Our, you know, our um, experience with architects is they are typically incentivized by building the biggest building um, and not necessarily architects, not all architects know what the reimbursement effects are of adding on space. And maybe part of that space you want provider-based rural health clinic if you're if you're provider-based, and maybe some of it you want provider-based clinic, not provider-based RHC, if you're adding on certain spaces and certain services. And so it's important for your architects to work with um, your consultants that do that analyzing and that you go through this process before engaging the architects. You can have this great idea in mind, this, these are you know, all the services that we wanna provide. This is, you know, this is the box we want and we want all these services, but the reimbursement is very important and you need to have this uh, upfront. You need to know what you can afford before engaging those architects. So you go to your architects and you tell them, this is what we can afford. And then you get the architects involved and then they can work hand in hand with um, those consultants that that have calculated what your clinic can actually afford. So that's one thing to consider one having a facility master plan and then when you go through that, you know, through that process of yes, there's a difference between what you want and what you can afford. There's also a difference between, um, you know, again, what you may want and what you may have, what may be required in the state as far as state licensing requirements. So in the state of Oregon, there there are no state licensing requirements for rural health clinics. But let's say we build an MOB and we want part of that rural health clinic, part of that space to be a rural health clinic, and part of that space to be a provider-based location or department of the hospital. In that case, where it's provider-based and it's built under the hospital's provider number, we have to make sure that that location or that um, part of the building 
meets outpatient construction code standards and can be licensed under the hospital. So that's really important to have a grasp on that. And that's where, you know, your, your plant facilities person should have a good grasp on that, have a good relationship with that state office of uh, your Oregon state office of licensing and, and make sure they have a full understanding regarding what's required. Do you have any resurvey requirements? If you fell under the or fall under the jurisdiction of your rural health clinic being certified and surveyed, surveyed under the state, simply adding on space um, to a clinic or moving it does not necessarily trigger a resurvey. Now the, the state may wanna come out and resurvey your clinic, but it doesn't mean that it triggers a new survey. If you are under the jurisdiction of an accrediting agency, you'll want to check with that accrediting agency and see what they require. You probably need to notify them and say, hey, we're adding on space. Does that require you to come out? Um, or what do you need to know? Or two, if you move, does that require a resurvey of your space? So you want to, to contact your accrediting agency. And is this, uh, if you add on to a rural health clinic, is it still considered part of the, the current address? So strategically, let's say we want to add on to our rural health clinic. We wanna make sure again, that that's all under one current address because our initial RHC certification was under our existing address. And once you change that address, that's a change of address. And that's the whole process that you have to go through. I can tell you that I'm working with a clinic right now that actually has two separate buildings. One of them is a for certified RHC. They're very close together and they're actually combining those two buildings into one. Um, the other building was previously being rented by an unrelated provider. He's now being employed by this hospital. They are combining that into one building and they are making it the previous address of, or the address of the first clinic that was certified and they're working with their fire department in order to make sure that uh, everything's good to go with that. And it's under the, the address of the originally certified RHC. So just some things to think about there. We can move to the next slide. So we talked about facility um, expansion. Let's talk about service expansion opportunities. Um, and Renia, if you wanna click again, so fact or myth, can specialists be included in RHC as allowable providers? RHC providers are defined as physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, certified nurse midwives, clinical psychologists, and clinical social workers. And that's the federal definition. If we add on specialists, again, say ortho providers, podiatrists, chiropractors, they're still considered RHC practitioners, even though they have a specialty um, associated with them. So we can incorporate those into the RHC. Again, we wanna make sure that we're predominantly providing primary care services and note that your mental health providers are considered specialists. When we're talking about primary care, we're really talking about family practice, internal medicine, um, OB women's health, pediatrics, um, urgent care. Those are really pr our primary care services. Outside of that is specialty, including mental health. So we can add on those, those specialty providers and be considered RHC. And again, when you do that, you want, really wanna analyze and find out if that's, how's that gonna affect your reimbursement? Maybe this results in a productivity standard problem when you incorporate a, a specialist into your rural health clinic, but maybe it increases your cost per visit so much that it's actually a win, even if you do have a productivity standard problem and that's on the Medicare side. If we're talking about Medicaid, Medicaid, we may add specialists, specialists or other providers to our RHCs and if they're highly utilized by Medicaid and maybe they're not necessarily Medicare RHC recognized practitioners, um, but on the Medicaid side they are, maybe we wanna incorporate that in. And let me give you an example. The state of Oregon indicates that physical therapists are actually RHC practitioners. Now, typically physical therapists are highly Medicare utilized, but let's say for the most part, your PT patients are Medicaid. On the Medicare side, we couldn't bill for a visit with that PT because the PT is not a recognized practitioner, but on the Medicaid side, they are, and we can bill and get paid at our cost per visit. So it's really important to know your state 
um, and the difference between your state's recognized providers and Medicare's recognized providers. And if you're if you're adding on a new service line or a new type of provider, how are how's Medicare going to pay for that service, and how how is Medicaid going to pay for that service? So something to consider that there. Next slide, please. Again, primary care is very important. So some opportunities, again, we may want to expand um, the capacity of the existing organization, again, by adding different services and different providers, chiropractors, podiatrists, we talked about mental health and walk-in or urgent care services. Um, in most states, mental health services and another service on the same day constitute two billable encounters. Um, and, and that's something to look into in on the CMS side, a mental health visit and another visit on the same day constitute two visits. So we want we want to consider that and make sure that we're billing appropriately. So when we're adding on different service lines, is there a difference in how we have to bill? And you know, RHC, the benefit of rural health clinic status really comes down to the billers. If you're not billing correctly for RHC services, you're not getting the benefit of the, the RHC certification. So we want to make sure anytime we have a change that we're billing appropriately and we have a good understanding of what's a billable encounter and what's not. Again, we, we, we may want to add on other specialties. And again, an important thing to consider is what's the payer mix of that particular service line that, that we would be adding. How would these providers, again, affect your productivity standard calculation? And does it even matter for you? If you're a freestanding rural health clinic, most of the times a productivity standard problem is not going to have an effect. Uh, the state of Oregon doesn't recognize productivity standards when calculating an initial rate or a change in scope. Um, and Medicare, most of the time you're capped out at your rate anyhow. So it's important to have a good understanding of how this is going to affect your reimbursement. And that's where I say analyze, analyze, analyze. You really want to make sure that you're doing a full uh, analysis regarding any changes that you're making. Walk-in urgent care, as we discussed before, these services are considered primary care and actually on their own. You can have a walk-in or urgent care within your rural, uh, rural health clinic or a, a separate rural health clinic it can be certified. Uh, urgent care can be certified as a rural health clinic. And, and what we're currently seeing is a lot of hospitals that are implementing these types of rural health clinics that are just adjacent to your emergency room. So we're keeping patients out of the emergency room. We're still being able to service them same day. We're getting RHC reimbursement. Um, and that's been a really great, you know, kind of strategy for, for some hospitals that we're, we're working with. One important question that you'll want to find out is how are other payers reimbursing for these services and how are you contracting with these payers? Uh, most of the times, you know, there's nothing at the state of Oregon that's going to certify you as an urgent care. If a patient walks into your facility and they have some sort of urgent care benefit and they think that this is going to be an urgent care visit, is that going to be a problem? And how are you contracting with payers, let's say it's a, a managed care plan and the patient is out of network, will the managed care plan pay for that visit? Um, even in a rural health clinic, we have to be thinking, yes, it's a face-to-face -face medically necessary encounter, but if it's a managed care plan for your RAP report in Oregon, in order to get paid, your cost per visit, it had to have been a paid encounter by the MCO. So if you had a denied encounter by the MCO, you're not going to be able to claim that visit on your on your RAP report. So these are things that you want to consider and want to work through with the state and your managed care plans. You know, maybe if it's urgent and emergent visit, they will pay for it, or you may have to turn those patients away. Uh, so these are some things to consider. Uh, other expansion opportunities. So school-based clinics, will your state recognize this as an RHC? Will they recognize it as an expansion of an existing RHC? So I will tell you, we're kind of in limbo right now because um, we know that school-based health clinics can be recognized RHC uh, clinics on their own. We have received previous information from several years ago that have indicated that Rural health clinics can go into a school without having a school-based clinic 
and get paid at the cost per visit um, and not have to do a school-based clinic necessarily. But we're getting some differing information now. So we're trying to get that all worked out. But this may be a method, and we know of other entities within the state of Oregon that have added on school-based clinics to their organizations and are getting paid under the RHC encounter rate. Um, another, another method is maybe a mobile clinic. Under your current RHC certification, you can actually add on a mobile clinic, and there are certain you know, requirements for adding on a mobile clinic. You have to have um, a consistent schedule. The services that you're providing must be in the current health professional shortage area. Um, there's information in the appendix G of the state operations manual, or if any of you have specific questions, I'm happy to get you information regarding that. But that's another method of maybe you don't want to necessarily have a brick and mortar clinic in order to provide services in a different area. And this is maybe a growth opportunity that you can see. You have a, a great Medicaid rate, a great Medicare rate. Maybe this is a method that you want to use for servicing patients and there's a need for it in some of those very rural areas. A mobile clinic on a certain day uh, of the week may be something that you want to explore. So that might be a, an area of growth that, um, that you could add to your list as kind of an idea. Another idea is developing networks and partnerships with maybe other hospitals or health systems or other clinics. Um, you know, recently in the last couple of years, we've had discussions with health systems that are thinking about collaborating on rural health clinics. Uh, their referral sources are rural health clinics and they wanna know how can they work together in order, order to have maybe one health system provide this specialty within the RHC and another system, health system, to provide the primary care practitioners. How can they do that collaboratively? Uh, maybe they have a service agreement um, where one, where the RHC is provider based to one health system, and another health system, um, you know, provides the providers and they're contracted, and they re reach some sort of um, method for reimbursement as far as like a some contracting fee. Those are all possible and it's things that we've explored uh, and there's methods for doing that. And we're seeing a lot of collaboration where we have health systems that are already in, you know, multiple, multiple health systems within a rural area, or they know they both are going to be expanding into an area. How can they collaborate together and not necessarily be adversarial? So we're seeing that a lot more. What services um, maybe do you provide within your market area and another rural health clinic provides in another area, but you, you know, you want to, uh, you don't necessarily want to find the providers and they have some capacity maybe you can contract with them to come to your rural health clinic and they can provide those services. So it, it's a great way to collaborate, to provide those services for the patients in your market area and fulfill a need that maybe not be met right now. So moving into a different service area, as I mentioned before, um, we have provider-based rural health clinics that are provider-based even in different states. So in this slide at the bottom of the state of Oregon, we have a facility there um, that has a clinic right over the border in California and it's provider-based. There are no mileage requirements. If your hospital is considered in a rural area, um, there are no mileage requirements. It doesn't have to be within 35 miles of your hospital if it's a provider-based RHC. Um, so that's, you know, really important. Um, it has to fall under the organizational chart of your hospital. It has to be financially integrated. It would be owned and operated by your hospital if it's provider-based, and you really want to make sure that you're they're meeting the provider-based rules. But it, it that's one thing that can um, that can occur. If you're a freestanding rural health clinic and you have multiple RHCs that you want to set up under one tax ID, you can do that and you actually have the opportunity to consolidate all of your RHCs under one uh, reporting requirement as far as a, a cost report for the Medicare intermediary. Also, uh, for provider-based RHCs, you can report them as well under one line department of your Medicare cost report. And it's something strategy-wise 
you kind of want to look at every year and see if that's maybe something that you want to do. Once you combine your rural health clinics, you can never really undo it. It's kind of a once and done and you have to request um, the ability to consolidate your rural health clinics on the cost report. But oftentimes it can mean a jump in your Medicare reimbursement. So just kind of a off topic kind of strategy for you there, combining cost reporting uh, lines on the cost report and consolidating cost reports for rural health clinics. Let's move to the next slide and talk a little bit more about considerations. So again, when we are talking about opportunities for potential growth, if we're talking about new service line and based on market need, again, what we wanna do is analyze, analyze, analyze. Again, how are you going to be paid by Medicare and Medicaid for these new services? Are these going to be covered Medicare and Medicaid services if we're adding on a new service line? How could our cost per visit be changed for Medicare? Um, not only just your rural health clinic cost per visit, but your organization as a whole. Again, if you're a provider-based rural health clinic, there could be a shift of overhead on your Medicare cost report that could affect your overall hospital reimbursement. So you wanna consider that. Um, how's it gonna affect your commercial payer? You know, your payer contracts, are they going to pay at the percentage that you're paying for other services uh, on this new service line? And what will contracting look for that, look like for that? So although Medicare and Medicaid are the only payers that recognize RHC status, we wanna make sure that we're, we're considering commercial payer contracts as part of that service line expansion. Also on Medicaid, uh, this is a really big part of the decision-making process, whether you wanna expand and how. When we're talking about expansion of services or a new footprint of the clinic, um, are they going to view this as a change in scope? Can a new rate be calculated? How is the new rate calculated? Note that the current Oregon guidelines are that they will not calculate a brand new rate. They don't do a complete rebasing. The state of Washington does, the state of Oregon does not, and they calculate an incremental change in the rate. Um, are productivity st standards included in your rate calculation? In the state of Oregon, they are not. They don't include the productivity standards as part of your rate calculation. Um, how are providers defined in your state or the adjacent state? So in the state of Oregon, RNs are actually considered RHC providers. Again, if we're adding on a service line, uh, maybe it's not recognized by Medicare as an RHC recognized practitioner, but this is gonna be a highly utilized Medicaid service line. Therefore, you know, we may lose some on the Medicare side, but we really gain on the Medicaid side because this is going to be paid at our all-inclusive encounter rate. Um, and if we, let's say we add on a brand new RHC to our existing tax ID, is it possible that the new RHC could adopt the rate of the clinic uh, existing RHC? Is that a possibility? These are things to ask the state. And, you know, there's been some changes at the state level. We always have different interpretations of the Oregon administrative rules. These are things to ask all the time. You may have one answer, you know, from a few years ago and someone else interprets it a different way now. So it's always important to get confirmation of these things up front. And I wouldn't do it after you make the change you wanna consider beforehand as part of your analyzation that you're doing as far as, again, if you wanted to add a service line, how does this affect your rate right now? And if you can get something in writing, then once you want to you know, request a change in scope or something like that, then you have the backup to say, yep, this was indicated that this qualifies as a, as a change in scope. I have it here in writing. Let's work together to calculate a new rate. Again, Medicare rate needs to be um, considered the same way. And we do need to think about the productivity standards when it comes to Medicare. Next slide. And other staffing costs, you know, what, what additional staff will be needed for these additional service lines? When we're looking at budgets, oftentimes I see we look at the direct costs of the healthcare uh, practitioners, but what about nursing staff and administration and billing staff? Are there gonna be changes in additional expenses uh, that we need to consider for, for staffing? Um, do we know the implications of adding a new service line 
Um, do we need to add additional billing staff in order to, to support that um, new service line, et cetera? Really important to discuss these types of things with revenue cycle up front. I can tell you um, we have you know a couple systems that use a certain product and you know, we think it's, well, we're already billing for a real health clinic. If we add another real health clinic, there shouldn't be a big build. They just already know what they're doing. And we add a real health clinic and revenue cycle says, hold up, wait, we have to do a whole new build for this real health clinic. And that's going to take, you know, three to six months to do. Um, you want to talk to them beforehand, beforehand because you never know how long of lead time they need in order to build that that particular RHC within their billing system. So having revenue cycle involved up front, they'll be a lot more happy. Um, they'll be easy to work with and they'll appreciate having been involved in those discussions up front. Enrollment considerations. You know, if we expand our services in an existing RHC, this doesn't require notification to Medicare. Note that with a Medicare application, we have an 855A where we list the area or the, the address of the clinic, but there aren't practitioners that are um, reassigned. They don't have their benefits reassigned to this particular application because we're billing using the RHC provider number. We're not billing with our, with our um, practitioner's provider numbers. But one thing that we may want to consider if we're expanding services, we may want to consider requesting an interim rate adjustment. If we're adding on a really expensive service line, rather than waiting until the end of the year to um, get our money for an increased cost per visit, maybe we want to request an interim rate, um, or vice versa. If we take services away, um, you know, maybe our rate at the end of the year is going to go down, and we don't want a big payback. Um, maybe we want to, um, you know, do our interim rate adjustment and and make sure we're kind of <clears throat> tracking that during the year. Does your state require anything for expansion of services? I know that Oregon does not um, currently there. They don't require that um, just simply expanding services. What does your accrediting agency, if you're following um, the compliance team or quad ASF, do they require anything if you add on practitioners or new service lines? You want to ask them about that. So implementation, once we've made a decision on how we're going to grow, uh, really three imperatives to achieving alignment across the organization is we want to make sure everyone knows what our goal is, sharing the vision, getting everyone on board. You know, I can tell you just within RHCs for everyone to have a vision of why we are an RHC, what are we trying to accomplish? Even in new, let's say you're just certifying a new clinic that maybe is freestanding and you're moving towards RHC status. A lot of times there's a lot of misconceptions by providers and healthcare staff regarding what's a rural health clinic. And you know, I I've been doing a lot of provider education regarding RHCs because they're scared. They hear one thing, you know, we we aren't going to be able to provide these certain services in a rural health clinic. Payments are going to be much different. You know, if we have education to everyone, what are we trying to accomplish? Why this is our increased reimbursement? This is why we're going RHC. You know, that's really important. Um, then everyone has a, a personal connection to that vision and how they can contribute to it and how they can align their individual work to achieve that vision and, and how you're going to move forward with your particular growth plan. So in conclusion, again, we want to gather all of our facts. We want to have a common fact base. Data gathering is really important. What's our strategic objective that we're working towards? Um, analyze, 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 quantifying those potential impacts of what we're trying to achieve um, and prioritizing how we're moving forward, implementing, of course, and then monitor. That's really important as well. And communication um, with everyone is super important, again, so everyone can get on the same page. And with that, we'll open up for questions.
Thank you. Thank you, Katie Joe, for the awesome presentation. And as always, you always share great information. Now we will go to the question and answer session. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the question and answer portion of this session. Please use the Q&A box to add your questions for Katie Joe today. Let's start with our first question. Could an RHC offer a wound care clinic as long as 51% or more of the codes being billed are for primary care services? If yes, anything to be careful of. Hi there. Well, I believe that wound care, uh, and I'm not, I'm not a clinician, but wound care, I don't believe, is a specialty in, of, in and of itself. It's not particularly the providers that are performing the service is the way that I understand it. It's more the nursing staff, et cetera, that's, that's performing the services. Um, so I don't believe it would be considered part of your 51% calculation. Again, I'm not a clinician, and that's maybe something we want to bet with a clinician. Uh, and certainly, I, if someone wants to email me, I might be able to look into that a little bit further. Again, my my gut feeling is it doesn't have to be considered in part of that 51%. Okay. Can an RHC have two encounters the same day for mental health and another visit? This is Medicaid. Yeah, well, let's just talk about both in case we have questions from someone about Medicare and Medicaid. So Medicare, yes, it's one of the benefits of rural health clinic status. We get to provide um, mental health services and you know primary care or other specialty services on the same day and we can receive two encounter rate payments and using that correct revenue code our revenue code 900 for our mental health visits is important on the medicare side um, on the medicaid side if you look in the the oregon administrative rules there's a section and i'm just going to blurt this out it's 410 147 0140 and it addresses multiple encounters and talks about multiple encounters that you can receive separate payment for and listed in that is mental health services it does say and i'm going to quote it here that if the client um, receives a mental health diagnosis um, on the same day as a medical office visit then it's really those client contacts are considered one encounter but if they're two distinct separate diagnoses um, we can have two separate encounters uh, and get paid for that separately. So it's a good question. Okay. What is the process if you added on services to your RHC for Medicare, Medicaid enrollment, as well as a rate setting? Okay, well, I, I touched on this a little bit during the presentation. Um, you know, keep in mind again, if, if we add services on, we're not necessarily moving our clinic, we can do that. Your RHC is certified by address. If you're not billing under your provider, you're billing under your RHC provider number. So on the Medicare side, we don't have to do anything. We're not, we have an 855A enrollment. We can move providers in and out of that space and that's fine. Um, same thing on the Medicaid side, we're billing under the clinic's RHC provider number. Now for Medicare managed care, and Medicaid managed care, we may have separate contracts where we have to credential those providers, of course, um, under our contract that we might need to do some additional work on. Regarding rates, if we're a provider-based RHC and we're already you know, up to our maximum rate per visit, there's really nothing that we want to do as far as requesting an interim rate adjustment. But if we're a provider-based rural health clinic, adding on those specialists may increase our rate per visit and what we might want to do is an interim rate request after we implement or you know shortly after we implement those providers so that we're not waiting until the end of the year when we file the cost report to get that increased rate. Um, plus we want to have an idea of you know maybe what our settlement's going to look like at the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Next question. If you are planning to move your RHC and expand services, what should you keep in mind as far as a notification to state and federal agencies? Yeah, this is a good question. So first of all, we really want to make sure that we, if we move our rural health clinic, that we're in compliance with those conditions of participation. There's nothing in the regulations to decertify a clinic that loses its 
HIPSA, it's Health Professional Shortage Area, um, or it's rural status. So with the census, obviously some things may change. If we move our clinic's location, that's the first thing that we wanna look at before we move, because if we move it, then we put that RHC status in jeopardy and actually we're not compliant anymore. So first thing is we wanna check our HIPSA status and we just wanna check our rural area status. And you can actually go to the site if you Google, am I rural? It'll come up with the, um, the website, it's the RAC center um, that you can then put in your address. You can see when your HIPSA was last updated, what your rural status is, et cetera. And uh, you wanna make sure that your HIPSA was last updated within four years. So first things first, check that. Then we want to make sure that we complete an 855A, which is a change of uh, information with the Medicare intermediary for that change in address. And we also have some forms that need to go to the state. A CMS 29 form goes to the state, and it, we need to notify Medicaid as well of that change of address and any other insurances, of course, we need to make sure that we notify them according to um, our contract and, and how we need to update them. Okay. See, what types of specialties do you typically see in a rural health care setting? We, you know, one of the largest ones I see is ortho in our rural health clinics. Um, our pre and post visits obviously can be done out of the rural health clinic and the surgeries done in the hospital. Uh, we have to make sure that we bill accordingly. If we're going to bill for those services out of the rural health clinic, we need to make sure that we're not getting paid globally out of the hospital. So correct billing for those services is really important. There's a modifier 54 that we have to bill for um, with a surgery in order to bill for those services out of the clinic. Some other services that I see um, popping up in clinics a lot now is podiatry, of course, chiropractic, keep in mind mental health, even though our, our LCSWs and clinical psychologists are considered RHC practitioners, those services are still considered specialty services. So mental health, we're seeing more and more um, eye services, um, ophthalmologists, optometrists are considered RHC practitioners, so we'll see those as well. And urgent care, really, again, it's not considered a specialty, but our urgent care and walk-in, I'm seeing more and more practices add that option and market it as such to their patient populations. And again, it's not a specialty, it's really considered um, primary care. Thank you. Can you bill for multiple visits on the same day if performed by different specialties? So we actually vetted this out with an attorney. We talked about mental health um, previously, and it, it states in the regulations mental health, we can obviously bill those as separate, separate visits. And, and we want to look at state to state on the Medicaid side and what they specifically state in the Oregon administrative rules. Beyond that, on the Medicare side, if we have lots of specialties within a rural health clinic, again, this was vetted out with an attorney and you may wanna talk with your attorney as well or another healthcare attorney. Um, what was determined was that multiple visits on the same day that are billed under the same tax ID and same provider number really constitutes one visit, even if it's performed by a specialist, specialist or different specialist. Um, so let's say we have a primary care visit and then a visit with an orthopedic specialist it really should be one encounter. Um, we're gonna get one payment rate from, from Medicare. And what we also wanna make sure of is then on the Medicare cost report, we're only counting one Medicare or one visit um, on the cost report as well. Thank you. Darn, Oof, that's tough. Um, what if you add specialties and it causes a production standard problem with regards to your Medicare rate calculation? Yeah, so oftentimes we will see that. I think I mentioned that earlier. Oftentimes, if we add specialists into our rural health clinic, it can cause a productivity standard issue. What we need to remember is adding those special specialists may up our cost per visit, even with a productivity standard issue anyhow, that it really negates the productivity standard issue. We also have the option, um, you may see in the, the COVID waivers, it addresses a productivity standard exception request that you can make, and that's not during the waiver. That's actually at all times. That's something that you can always request from the intermediaries, a productivity standard exception, and it's really up to them whether or not they grant it. That's kind of a whole different subject. Um, I would be happy to discuss that if you guys have any questions regarding that. 
Um, but analyzing it, and again, what you should be doing prior to even adding those specialists onto an RHC is analyzing whether or not it's going to cause a productivity standard issue. And if it does, does it really matter? Because again, you, if your cost per visit's going up overall, and that's spread over all of your services, it might be a win even with a productivity standard issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see. Can, this kind of goes back to the school-based health center or just a regular school. Can an RHC provider see a patient in a school or a school-based health center and bill the service under their current RHC? It is my understanding, and we just vetted this with the Oregon um, RHC program manager, that yes, it can. Offsite services, and this is where Oregon is so much different than other states, offsite services can still be considered RHC services as long as one, we're meeting the definition of an RHC practitioner and it's a covered service. So we may have a school based health center that is separately certified and we get an RHC type rate anyhow, or maybe we're doing services in the school um, and they're provided by a nurse practitioner and we're providing. Um, services that are covered under the definition of an RHC visit, then we can also build that under the RHC provider number. Okay. Can't, let's see. Can you tell us more about the requirements of a mobile clinic? Does the mobile RHC require certification? If you have an existing rural health clinic, it is possible to add on mobile services to your existing RHC. Again, there's certain uh, requirements as far as where you provide the services. You have to be providing them in a health professional shortage area. You have to have consistent hours um, that you're providing the services. So you can't just say, you know, um, we may be, the, be here at this day. It's got to be like, okay, on the third Monday of every month, we're going to be we're going to be here and we're consistently providing services. So we don't have to get a separate certification. We can simply add them on. If we do not have an RHC and we just want to certify a mobile RHC, then that would have to go through the certification process altogether. Uh, but it is poss possible. If you look in the state operations manual, so if you Google Appendix G, um, state operations manual, there's a section in there regarding mobile RHCs. And keep in mind, the state operations manual is not regulatory. It is guidance to rural health clinic surveyors. So there's information in there uh, and it's good information, but I, I, I would, I caution you when say, go by the regulations um, and, and butt that out, you know, it may give you some good information, but if you see things that are a barrier, don't necessarily think that that's the only way you can get to your answer. But anyhow, in there, it does has an information regarding mobile RHCs. Okay, let's see. Um, this this might be off topic. It might not. I don't know. You tell me what you think. Is okay. a pharmacist a recognized RHC provider? If not a recognized provider, do you see pharmacists working in RHCs? Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah. That's a question that I have actually been asked. Quite mm -hmm. a bit. Yeah, I have too. So Medicare, no, we're not. Pharmacists are not recognized RHC practitioners. Can they provide services in an RHC? Yeah, it's like physical therapists, right? The regulations don't say that we can't provide those services in a rural health clinic. It's how are we gonna get reimbursed for them? So if we provide those services in an RHC and they're providing e &M level services, because it, it depends on the state that you're in, can you provide e &M level services, which I know many states are now saying pharmacists can be, act as providers and provide e &M level services we still have to go by the federal definition of an RHC practitioner. And for Medicare purposes, they are not considered an RHC practitioner. So how do we treat them when we bill for their services? We can't. If they have a visit on the same day, if let's say we have a provider visit and then the pharmacist sees them for something else, all the charges would be bundled on our UBO4 claim and we would get one encounter rates and the patient would pay 20% of total charges in coinsurance. But the patient just came to the clinic and saw the pharmacist, we wouldn't be able to bill for a visit. On the flip side, on the Medicaid side, it's my understanding as well that pharmacists are not considered RHC practitioners. Again, we'd want to vet that out um, with a program manager. And I know I have before, I'd have to look at it. Um, I don't think they are in Oregon, but honestly, again, I hate 
I, I like to have it in writing every single time. I don't think they're considered RHC practitioners. Not that, again, that they can't provide those services. It's just whether or not we can get reimbursed under our RHC rate. Okay, thanks. Oh, you're, you're awesome, Katie. Okay. Um, okay, so this concludes the first day of the RHC workshop. Um, we will begin day two of the RHC workshop tomorrow at 10 a.m. with Jennifer Smith from OHA sharing the Medicaid wraparound payment process. Thank you, Katie. It's just so wonderful to have you. Thank you, audience, for attending day one of the Office of Rural Health RHC workshop.